presence this morning. We honor your name and we thank you that we are blessed in the city. We thank you that we are blessed in the field. Lord, your word declares that we're blessed when we come and when we go. And so today, Lord, we don't only celebrate the blessings, but we celebrate the blessor. Lord, you have blessed us. You have kept us. You have been good to us. Lord, because of you, we are here this morning by your grace and through your love, oh God. So be enthroned in the praises of your people as we recall how blessed we are. Lord, we understand that it's all because of you. Lord, you alone deserve the honor. You alone deserve the glory. And do we give you the praise this morning. And all God's blessed people say it one more time. We're blessed. We're blessed in the city. We're blessed in the field. We're blessed when we come and we go. We cast down every stronghold, sickness and poverty must be. For the devil is defeated, we are blessed. We're blessed in the city, we're blessed in the field. We're blessed when we come and when we go. We cast down every stronghold, sickness and poverty must be. For the devil is defeated, we are blessed. Come on, if you bless, clap your hands real big and let the Lord know how much you appreciate him this morning. Hallelujah. If you're blessed, why don't you turn and tell your neighbor three things that you're blessed about. Just three things really quick. Come on, turn and tell your neighbor three things that the Lord has blessed you with. Ben, how great is our God? Let's go. Come on, testify of his goodness, of his faithfulness to you. 
Hallelujah. He woke you up. He protected you. Hallelujah. He let you see another day. Hallelujah. He's a great and magnificent God. Worthy of praise. Hallelujah. We honor your name this morning, God. You're great in all of your ways. Let's talk about him. How great is our God? Let's sing it together. How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God?
worship your great God this morning. Come on, if he's a great God, he deserves a great praise. Amen. I said if he's a great God, he deserves a great praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The song says that his name is above every name. That means that the name of depression, his name is above it. The name of poverty, his name is above it. The name of racism, his name is above it. And so we declare his name in this place this morning. God, we declare that your name is above all name. And because of who you are this morning, because of who you are, we can honor you and we can give you glory. Sometimes situations want to steal our praise, amen. You're going through difficult times and praise doesn't come as easy. But when you think about who God is, praise is natural, amen. Can anybody praise him simply because of who he is this morning? He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the one who died on the cross for us. He is our redeemer. He is our savior. He's our healer. He's everything to us. So if I invite you to enter into that space of just honoring him because of who he is this morning. Let's sing together. Because of who you are. Because of who you are, I give you glory. Because of who you are, I give you praise. Are you singing to the king this morning? Because of who you are. Because of who you are, I will lift my voice and say, Lord, I worship you. Give him glory in this place because of who you are. Because of who you are, I give you praise. Because of who you are. Because of who you are. I will lift my voice. I will lift my voice and say.
It's because of who you are, yeah. Because of who You're everything. you are, I give you praise. Because of who you are. Because of who you are. I will lift my voice. I will lift yeah. my voice and say. Lord, I worship Lord, you. I worship you. Because of who you are. Lord, I worship you. So we worship you because of, because of who you are. You are King of Kings, our Lord of Lords. So we give you worship, God, because of who you are. Because you're holy, you because you're worthy, God. Lord, oh. I worship you because of who you are. Come on, fill this room with worship this morning. Come on, fill this room with worship this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Because of who you are, God. Because of who you've been to all of us, God. We honor you this morning. We bless you. We love you and adore you. And God, we need you. Whether we realize it or not, we are in desperate need of a savior of a God who calls us by our name, a God who walks alongside of us in difficult times, and a God who promised, when you call on me, I will answer you. I'll show you great and mighty things that you don't even know. So it's prayer time in the sanctuary, South Bay. If you have a need, we invite you to come to the altar to meet with God this morning. If you want to stand in place of someone else who needs healing, someone else who needs a breakthrough, some, someone else's marriage that's struggling, we invite you to come to this altar this morning as we call on God together. He's so faithful to answer whatever we need. Thank you, Jesus. But we thank you in advance for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord. want to come stand with somebody you can come stand with your brother your sister almighty god we need you we need you right now reveal your glory and pour your spirit out fathers we stand in your presence this morning God, we're so grateful that we don't walk through life by ourselves. And Lord, we're so grateful for that all those who have come to this altar this morning, you know exactly what they need from you this God. 
And so, God, we just come in faith. We come in obedience to your word. Lord, you told us that we could cast our cares on you because you care for us. And so we are here this morning, God, trusting in your word this morning that says, I'll never leave you. I won't forsake you. That even in the darkest times, I am with you. That I will be a shelter in time of storm. Lord, you promise that he who dwells in the secret place of the Almighty will abide under your shadow. And so here we are, Lord, seeking the secret place in prayer this morning, oh God. But for every life that is at this altar this morning, we ask by the power of God Almighty that you would begin to minister to every heart, oh God. Lord, that you would begin to address every concern in the name of Jesus. Lord, every health concern, God, we ask for the healer to come into touch. From the top of our heads to the very soles of our feet, oh God, to down the very cellular level of our bodies. Let the healing power of God Almighty flow now in the name of Jesus. We trust you to do it, God, because we've seen you do it before. Lord, for those who are looking for jobs and looking for employment, God, and wondering, Lord, what the future holds, we're grateful that you said, for I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Lord, we stand on your word this morning. God, we ask that you would order steps that you give us favor in the name of Jesus on job interviews and different opportunities, that your favor would rest on us, God. Lord, that man would, where man may say no, God, you would say yes. And that you would open doors, Father, that we can walk into everything that you have declared over our lives in the name of Jesus. And when you bless us, we will realize that we are not blessed just to be blessed, but we are blessed to bless someone else in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray for marriages this morning. God, you know where we are in our marriages this morning. Some put smiles on our faces and we just, we go through the motions, God, but we need a revival in our marriages. Lord, so send your spirit, Father. Let it rest on every husband. Let it rest on every wife. Lord, send a spirit of reconciliation and love and joy and commitment and dedication. God, bless marriages this morning. And even for those who are single, who desire to be married, God, sometimes they get forgotten, Lord, but I pray for the singles this morning, for those who desire companionship, for those who are waiting for you to bring someone, Lord, strengthen the singles, Father, in the name of Jesus. Order their steps, God. Help them not to settle or compromise, but let them know that we can wait on you, oh God, that you know exactly what we need when we need it. Lord, for those who are having concerns about our children, God, we're so grateful that you blessed us with them, and sometimes we don't know what to do. But God, we lift our children to you this morning. Lord, we place our children in your hands this morning. Some of them are adult children, and we're still worried about them, God, but we lift them to you in the name of Jesus, that wherever they are in this moment, that you can touch them, God, because you know exactly where they are, and you know exactly what they need. Lord, bless our children, even our grandchildren. God, we pray for this church. God, that, you're pour, that you would pour out your spirit on South Bay. God, we desire, we desire to be a light in dark places. And we can only do that by the power of your spirit. So let your glory rest in this house. Let your power rest on the leadership, God. Help us to hear from you, God and to speak whatever you would give us. Now, Lord, we make the decision right now to walk in victory in the name of Jesus. We make the decision right now, Father, that we have laid our cares before you, that we won't leave this building with what we came in with, but we give up our confusion and our sadness for your peace and for your joy. We lay it at your feet this morning. We thank you that you hear us when we pray. Lord, that we're not just talking, but we are praying to a living God who hears us and who knows us. Thank you for your promises, God, and for every other prayer request that's at this altar. Could you meet us at the point of our need this morning, God? Could you be the glory and the lifter of every head, oh God? 
in the name of Jesus. Help us to remember that we don't walk alone, but the God of heaven goes before us. And if God be for us, who can be against us? We thank you for victory this morning. And all God's grateful people, come on, put your hands together real big and honor the Lord. Come on, praise him in advance for your answered prayer. It's on the way. It's a settled issue. God did it on the cross for us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. As you go back to your seat, just go back rejoicing and thanking God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody glad for the Lord this morning? I said, is anybody glad for the Lord this morning? I'm going to make y'all get up and run a lap of praise if y'all don't wake up. <laughs> Hey, listen, it's a special time in our service, and we want to honor anyone who may be visiting with us for the first or second time. Do we have any visitors this morning? Anybody? Right here. God bless you, sis. Thank you for being with us. South Bay, can we make her feel welcome? One more right here. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Is your hand up? Thank you so much for being here. A whole family back there. We realize that you could be anywhere else this Sunday morning. So the fact that you decided to come and be with us here at South Bay, it means a lot to us. So thank you for coming. South Bay, can we make our guests feel welcome one more time? Amen. And I know you just got back to your seats and you're all comfortable, but it's a time in our service where we greet one another. So if you guys could stand up, we're going to say hello to one another for the next three minutes or so. And then we're going to move on with our service. Give somebody a great big hug. Let them know that you're glad to see them.
morning, family. It's always so, this is such a loving congregation. It's hard to get us all back together after we pass the peace. It is actually time for the offering. And that's a time that we celebrate here at South Face. Would you join me in praising God? And would the host please come forward? So it's an opportunity for us to remind you that your tithes and offerings are not just a South Bay, but they're for the benefit of God's kingdom. We acknowledge God as our ultimate source, and we're the resource. So all of the blessings that he bestows upon us flow back out through us to our community and to God's kingdom. So would you join me in prayer this morning? Eternal and living God, we thank you, Lord, for being our Jehovah Jireh, for being our provider, Lord God, for those things that are tangible and intangible, those things that we see and can't see, Lord God. We are so grateful, and we're grateful not just because you have bestowed these blessings upon us, but because of who you are. We don't take it for granted that we have the privilege to come to your throne of grace, Lord God. There's none like so, Lord, we, Lord God, we just ask that right now that you would bless our tithes and offerings, that you would bless those who have the resources to, to share, and also those who do not, Lord God. Be a blessing to them and their households as well. We just ask that you would bless our gifts and multiply them for your use in the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning we're going to do something a little bit different. You are uh, going to be graced with my voice today instead of the video. We just have a few highlights to share with you for the coming week. So the first thing is, um, you know that we have had the SAI, the Summer Algebra Institute, going on this summer, and it is coming to an end. So each of you is cordially invited to the culminating service, which is this Friday at 6.30 here at South Bay. The students have worked so hard this summer, and it's an opportunity for us to celebrate their achievements. And as an added bonus, the, uh, the guest speaker for the evening is none other than our own Tiffany Lockett. So in the tradition of SAI, it's a potluck dinner. Um, so we'll eat together first and then enjoy the program. Um, so please, uh, please join us. And if you're interested in joining us and contributing a potluck dish, contact Misha Jones. Misha, are you here? So just raise your hand. And there is an email address. Um, and this will go out in the journey as well, correct? All right. Next, we have a backpack drive, which we do each year to bless the, um, the young people in our area. We're partnering with One Child to help children in need start the school year with a smile. There are lists in the lobbies about the supplies that are needed, and bins will be available to uh, receive your donations. So please consider uh, partnering with us and One Child. Next, who doesn't like lunch in a movie? We are showing the movie Bell here. Um, there are two days, and there the, uh, the dates will be distributed via email. But it's an opportunity for us to view the movie and just continue our discussions about uh, race and diversity in America as a family. You'll get an email about this, and you would purchase your tickets on via e not purchase, pardon me. They are free tickets. You would reserve your tickets via Eventbrite, just so we can plan for you um, for the meal. And then finally, um, there is a women's retreat, a covenant women's retreat in October, October 6th through the 9th. I'm sorry, just October 6th, Saturday, October 6th. Um, it's a day in the beautiful mountains with Christ-like women. Um, the keynote speaker is Reese Sky, and the guest presenter is our own co-lead pastor, Tammy Long. There's early registration, which ends on August 12th, and again, you can sign up on via Eventbrite to attend. There's some information in the foyer um, if you are interested in attending, and that would be it for our announcements. Thank you. Are you guys ready to hear the word? I said, are you ready to hear the word? Can you just tap the person next to you and say, are you awake this morning? I know it's a fifth Sunday, but the Lord is good. You got some breath. You should be smiling or something. Praise God. 
Um, listen, we are so blessed this morning that we have Pastor Tammy Long is going to be bringing the word this morning. Can we celebrate Pastor Tammy? <laughs> Love you, Tam. And before she shares the word, we are so blessed to have um, one of the uh, most anointed saxophone players I've ever heard in my life um, with us today. If you haven't heard him, you're going to be so blessed. His name is Byron Lockett, and he comes by way of Dayton, Ohio. Is that correct? I think you should come out because you like in the shadow. Is that right? Come on out. Give him a hand. He's going to minister to us this morning. And then after he finishes ministering, the next voice she will hear will be our very own Pastor Tammy.
Thank you, brother. You know, there's a difference between a performance and a ministry unto the Lord. And we were able to share in a worship of a ministry unto the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sometimes all you need to know is that, yes, Jesus loves me. Amen. If you have been with us this summer so far, you know that we have been tackling some pretty hot topics. Last week, we completed a mini-series where we sought to reason together around the topic of same-sex attraction and gender identity by exploring key principles for living in both grace and truth according to God's word. Next week, we're going to begin another mini-series called Race Still Matters. You need to. Next week, we'll be starting another mini-series called Race Still Matters, where we will look at current events and hold them in light of what God is doing in these tense times and how God may be inviting us to partner with him. So I, as I thought about the message for today, I got this vision in my mind of a hinge or a connector or a bridge. I wanted to consider how do we connect these two mini-series hot topics? What does God tell us as we look at these issues? And I felt God saying to me, the core here, the core that he wants us to understand at the basic level is how to love well. How to love well. How to grow in loving others the way that God loves us with compassion and mercy. Jesus said the world would know that we are his followers by our love, and we all know that that is not how that cult, this culture sees us, we are not known by our love. We have struggled to love the LGBTQ plus community well and, and we haven't done the best job. We don't know what to do with bigotry and racism because our feelings of injustice and pain can run so deep. It can stir us up to anger and hatred in our own hearts. You know, but there's nothing new under the sun. And God's word has a response for everything. So to unpack God's response for how do we love well, we're going to look at a famous Bible story this morning. In fact, this story, I believe, is probably one of the most famous stories in the Bible. There are hospitals named for this story. If you look up this this name in the encyclopedia or the dictionary, it's in there. You will find this name, even though the real name of the person is never mentioned in the Bible. There's even a law named from this story. Anyone know what story I'm talking about? The Good Samaritan, you're right. The parable of the Good Samaritan. And because this story is so famous, it can be tempting for us to kind of check out about now and say, oh, yeah, I know that story. But I would encourage you to join me and listen with fresh ears. That's what I love about the Bible. It is God's living word, which means God has something alive and something fresh to share. I invite you to please stand with me. We will read from Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 37. 
Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 37, and I'll wait a few minutes while you look for it on your devices or in God's word. One more time, it's Luke 10. We'll be starting at verse 25. And if you have it, please say amen. Hear the word of the Lord. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by. But a Samaritan, I'm sorry, so too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Heavenly Father, as we come before your word this morning, God, I ask that you would speak through us during this time. Lord, it is not an accident that we are here and you have a word for each one of us. May our hearts receive, may our minds be open, may our ears hear. And God, I ask that you would remove the messenger and that your word would go forth exactly the way you would have it go. We ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and you may be seated. I suspect that if I were to ask you to tell me about your neighbors, I'd get some interesting and maybe even some funny stories. One person recently told me, and he just said it in passing, but it intrigued me. He said that his neighbor in his apartment complex leaves a post-it note on his door every single holiday celebrating the holiday. And I said, every single holiday? And he said, yes, he doesn't miss a holiday. And I said, well, are you guys friends? Do you hang out? And he said, no, we just greet each other in the hall. I said, well, why does he do that? He says, I don't know. And I said, well, how long has he been doing that? And he said, nearly three years. And I'm like, wow, that's interesting, interesting. It's another person who lives in a beautiful area of the East Bay Hills told me about their neighbor who rented out the house next door. And the, he, uh, he learned that the tenants that he rented to had turned the entire house into a marijuana farm. Although the person telling me the story lived right next door to the renters, they had no clue what was really going on inside the house. She said the new neighbors were quiet and respectful. They greeted each other. They had no clue until the homeowner came back because the rent was past due. And when the homeowner went in, the tenants were gone, the plants were gone, the windows were covered and the floors were covered wall to wall deep in soil that told the story. 
My own neighbor is a deacon of a Spanish-speaking congregation. And a couple times a month, always on a Thursday, they must hold a worship service or a Bible study because I can hear them through the adjoining wall that we share. And let me tell you, I cannot tell you what they are saying, but I know that they are definitely worshiping God with lots and lots and lots and lots of gusto. Even my adjoining wall kind of gets a little dance into the act, if you know what I mean. It is that spirited. And I'm sure you may have your own bizarre or intriguing or interesting neighbor's stories as well. Usually when we think of neighbors, we think of people who live in close proximity to us. We may get along with our neighbors. We may not get along with our neighbors. We may not even know our neighbors. But people living in close proximity is the most common definition of neighbor. In fact, if you look it up in a dictionary, it's the number one definition, someone who lives close next to someone else. But I wonder if by using this definition of neighbor, we can categorize even subconsciously that there are some people who are our neighbors, and then there are some people who are not our neighbors. That was true in Jesus' day, too. In fact, this is what the law expert in our story was, was really getting at when he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Some Bible versions call the man a lawyer, but he was not a judicial lawyer. He was an expert in Jewish law and tradition. He was responsible for knowing what the law said and then teaching that to others on, so that they could please God according to the law. And he apparently knew the Jewish law very well because when he asked Jesus what he must do to gain eternal life, Jesus turns it back on him and says what is written in the law. The man answers by combining a passage from Deuteronomy and Leviticus and, and repeats what we have come to know as the great commandment. To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus tells the man that he has given the correct answer. Luke goes on to say that the man tried to justify himself by asking who is my neighbor? And you can almost hear the silent, who is my neighbor exactly? Now, his question may or may not have been a sly as it appears because we, we really don't know his motive for asking. In the ancient Jewish book of wisdom, Sirach, it actually states that Jews are not supposed to help sinners. In Jesus' day, Jews did not consider sinners neighbors when they quoted the love your neighbor passage. For a Jew, a neighbor was someone who looked like, believed like, acted like, and loved God the way, same way that they did. Regardless of whether the man was seeking clarity about who is a neighbor or trying to test or trap Jesus, doesn't matter. Jesus' response was not what he or anyone else listening expected. In responding to the question, who is my neighbor, Jesus answers with a story. It was a story that would have grabbed their hearer's attention right away because it depicted a scenario that they knew quite well. The road to Jericho from Jerusalem was 17 miles long and it was a treacherous route. Think of walking through a known gang territory by yourself. That was akin to the Jericho Road. People got beat up and robbed on that road. Robbers lived in the hills and caves along this route where it was easy for them to hide and wait for unsuspecting travelers, such as the fate of the victim in our story. Furthermore, Jericho was a wealthy community, and many priests and religious leaders lived there, so that next part of the story was plausible as well. And truth be told, it may not have even been particularly shocking for the original hearers that the priest and the Levite passed by the wounded man. In ancient writings, the term half-dead meant that by all appearances, the person was dead. 
and the original hearers may have assumed or understood that the religious leaders passed by in order to maintain their ceremonial purity laws. To touch a dead person would have made them unclean. Even fact, for their shadow to touch a dead person would make them unclean. So unlike us, the original hearers may not have been so appalled that the religious leaders kept going. But by now, they would have been deeply intrigued by the story. Since Jesus already had a priest and then a Levite who was a temple assistant pass by, the original hearers would have been anticipating that the next person to enter the scene would probably be a Jewish lay person like them. But Jesus completely shocks them. Jesus makes the hero of the story a Samaritan. I can imagine the murmurs and glances when Jesus had a Samaritan be the hero of the story. Many would have been highly offended and insulted. Others probably would have walked away in a huff, indignant, while others may have been curious and perplexed and, and wondered what this was all about. Now, the fact that the hero was a Samaritan is not a big deal to us. We don't really get it because we don't get the cultural context of the day. The truth is, the Jews and the Samaritans deeply despised each other for ethnic and religious reasons. They had been at odds for centuries. They would, in fact, go way out of their way, even if it meant miles, just to avoid one another. They considered one another those people. Think of Jews and Nazis in Germany. Think of whites and blacks, particularly in the Deep South. Perhaps today, even think of reds and blues. It was preposterous that Jesus would cast a Samaritan as the hero in the story. To a Jew, a Samaritan was a non-neighbor. Not only did Jesus make the unthinkable Samaritan the one who stops and cares, but his care was lavish and extravagant and sacrificial. Jesus gives detail regarding how the Samaritan cared for the victim. Jesus tells us that he bandaged him. He poured oil and wine on his wounds. Oil soothed the womb and wine disinfected the womb. Goes on to say that he put the victim on his own donkey and took him to the inn, which means now the Samaritan is walking instead of riding. The text says he cared for him and he, and he must have spent the night because it says the next morning he tells the innkeeper, he pays the innkeeper. And he gives enough, he gives two denarii. Biblical historians believe that two denarii would be enough to cover anywhere from 30 to 60 days of recovery time. Then he also arranged for any outstanding costs to be paid at his own personal expense when he returned. The Samaritan gave more than just passing care. He became deeply involved. He jeopardized his own safety on Jericho Road. He was inconvenienced, and he sacrificed both time and money to care. At the end of the story, when Jesus asked the law expert, who was a neighbor, there was no question. It was uncomfortably obvious. In fact, it almost appears that the law expert couldn't even say the word Samaritan. His answer was to say, the one who showed mercy. Jesus simply says, go and do likewise. Now, the Good Samaritan is a beautiful story that can convict us and inspire us and challenge us on how to love well. Each character has something to offer us, something to teach us. 
regarding how to love well. First, we know that we do not want to be the priest or the Levite that passes by on the other side and leaves the wounded to whatever happens. We know we don't want to be that guy. Although if we are truly honest, we may recognize that all too often that's exactly who we are. We can sometimes close our eyes and our ears to cries and issues that we really don't want to deal with. We can act like we don't know or choose not to know what is going on around us in the world, around the corner, or maybe even in our families. Perhaps we get overwhelmed by all the pain and hurt we see because we really don't know what to do. So we keep moving. We pass by. There is an ignorant bliss that can come from not getting too close, not investigating the truth of things. It can be much easier to trust and pray that someone else will come along behind us and handle it. I don't know about you, but as I held this passage before God for myself, I recognize with horror, actually, how much I can be that priest and Levite. I had to ask for forgiveness and for a renewed heart to love better. We can be that priest and Levite. At the same time, we may also see ourselves as the Good Samaritan in the story who regularly helps others. We may even pride ourselves a little bit when we think of all the times we have helped another person, all the times we have shown mercy, all the times we have shown compassion. And we are a very giving and loving community. So I have no doubt that there are a lot of Good Samaritans out there. I have seen you in action. I have been the recipient of your action. We can also be good Samaritans. But even so, I think that there is more to the invitation that Jesus presents in this story. Jesus simply says again, go and do likewise. But when we peel back the layers of the story, there's nothing simple about it. Because Jesus made the hero of the story an unexpected neighbor. He reframed the very definition of neighbor to include all of humanity, especially those people, whoever those people may be. It's been said that the term Good Samaritan for Jews was an oxymoron. You could not have good and Samaritan in the same sentence by definition. And so it made me wonder, who or what group of people might that be in our lives? Ponder that for a moment. Who does the Spirit, Holy Spirit, bring to your mind when you think of those people. Perhaps it's an ethnic group or a political group or a religious group or some other group. Perhaps it's a personality type or a certain character trait or flaw that just gets under your skin. Maybe even now a specific person is coming to your mind. Our preferences, our biases, our prejudices can come in all shapes and sizes, and they can run deep. We may not even be aware, really, of how much we may avoid or ignore or stay away from those people, whoever they are. But these are the people that Jesus said, go and do likewise. So one more character in the Good Samaritan that I want us to hold and reflect on and, and see what God may want to say to us through these eyes. And this is the victim in the story. 
We don't usually talk about him very much. We know that we can sometimes be the priest and the Levite, and, and we need to repent about that. And we know that sometimes we get it right and we actually are a good Samaritan and, and we partner with God with that. But I wonder what God may want to teach us through the eyes of the wounded man. I invite you to use your holy imagination and, and visualize with me. You may even want to close your eyes for a few seconds and, and put yourself in his space. You've just been beaten up. You're barely conscious, and you're exposed because your clothes have been taken. You're in and out of consciousness, and you're more out than you are lucid. Then you hear footsteps, and you try to open your eyes, and you can only partially see because your eyes are swollen. As the person gets closer, your blurry vision recognizes what appears to be a priest. <sighs> you do a deep sigh of relief and close your eyes because help is coming. You wait. And you wait. Something's not right. The footsteps you heard coming closer, you now hear fading away. That priest has passed you by. Now you barely have enough energy to swallow when you hear new footsteps in the distance. Your hope is rekindled. It takes all the energy you can muster to open your eyes again. You can tell by the attire that this too looks like a religious leader, a temple assistant perhaps. You try to say, but only a whisper comes out. You realize you're holding your breath as the man gets nearer. You wait and wait, hoping and listening. And it happens again. You soon hear footsteps fading in the distance. By the time you hear the third footsteps, you're too weak to even open your eyes. You're not even sure you actually hear anyone. You're fading fast. Then you feel this gentle touch, a momentary sting as wine is poured on your cuts, and then the refreshing, soothing feel of oil. You're so grateful. You open your eyes partially only to see that the person tending to you is a Samaritan. Now, as you reflect on that character in the story, you may be feeling gratitude right now. You may be feeling, ah, oh, God has answered my prayers. But I wonder what was really going through our victim's mind in that moment. I want you to consider for a moment what your first reaction might have been if when you opened your eyes, you saw the very last person on earth that you would ever want to touch you. If you opened your eyes and saw that the person next to you was that other that came to your mind earlier. As wounded as he was, I believe that our victim initially was conflicted. And I'm basing that on the fact that our biases and prejudice can run so deep. He might have even prayed, God, I'm grateful for your care, but why did you have to send a Samaritan? The Samaritan was an unexpected neighbor. And we can assume that without him, our wounded man would have died. I wonder how often we are like that man on the side of the road. 
I wonder if we are open to recognize and accept the help and the support that we may need, the answers we may be looking for, the, the pieces we may need to get back on our feet or move ahead when it comes from an unexpected neighbor. Someone who may not look like us, someone who may not even like that we like or want to associate with, someone we may regard as those people. Can we be open to receive from them? I wonder what if they are exactly who God has sent? Unexpected neighbors to help us walk on our journey. I wonder how open we are as a church to receive the support, the help, the fellowship of unexpected neighbors. People that God may want to send our way because they have something to offer us that we may not even realize we need. Can we be open? Are we open to receive what those people may have to share with us? When we limit, limit neighbors to our own categories and preferences, we also limit where our fellowship and friendship may come from. We can actually block the very thing that God wants to do with us, and that is to demonstrate his love in the world, which, as the story of the Good Samaritan illustrates, often comes from the most unexpected places and often from unexpected people. Can we be open to receive that? Early in my years as an educator, I was on staff at a school, and I remember participating in one of those team-building exercises. This was one of those exercises where it's a, a survival simulation, and you're placed in a small group team, and you're supposed to work through the survival scenario so that you survive. And since we were all on staff together, I knew everyone on my team, including this one woman that I'll call Susan, who for the most part stayed to herself uh, on our team on, as a staff. She was the one least connected to anyone in the group. She was the quietest. She was the most withdrawn. And as we worked through this survival simulation, the rest of us really got into it. And by the end of our time, we were virtually unanimous about the best way to approach this survival scenario. We were high-fiving everybody. We had this all made. Susan listened to the group, but she said very little. And frankly, I'm embarrassed to admit that we didn't go out of our way to include her either. As the facilitator called and told us that the final moments were happening, someone realized that we hadn't really heard from Susan yet and asked her thoughts. And Susan timidly shared that she had a completely different insight from the rest of us. And, and she went on to unfold how she thought we should solve the problem in this scenario. And frankly, we thought it was a little weird. We were polite, but we were dismissive. After all, the, the majority of us had, had already figured this out, and we, we knew what the solution was, and we were going to take home the prize. When the facilitator called time and began unpacking the scenario specifics, it wasn't long before it became very clear that Susan had the right answer, and we had dismissed her. Susan was our unexpected neighbor on our team, and we failed to receive from her. I've never forgotten that. It's, it's gone back over 25 years now, but I have never forgotten it as, as, a, as a manager, as a leader. It taught me to always listen to the lone voice. At least listen, because you never know where the answer you need, where what you need is going to come from. So I'll say it again. When we limit neighbors to our own categories and preferences, 
we also limit where our support and fellowship and friendship and help may come from. And we can block the very thing God wants to do to demonstrate his love in the world in unlikely ways. I started this morning by saying that I felt led to make this hinge, this connection, this bridge between our two summer series. And I felt that God placed it on my heart that, that the invitation he is really in inviting us into is to learn to love well. So what does that look like? How do we begin loving well? Well, first, I think we have to recognize that from Jesus' viewpoint, there's no such thing as an unexpected neighbor. By making the Samaritan the hero of the story, Jesus was teaching that there is no them and us. There's only we. Loving our neighbor transcends geographical location or any man-made group because in the beginning, God created all of humanity in his image. We are all brothers and sisters who share the image of God in our souls. Whoever those people are for you and for me, each person bears the imprint of God, and God loves them dearly. Genesis 1.27 says it clearly. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. We love well when we grasp that every person is God's beloved. Whether they know him or not, God loves them. And I'm not suggesting that this love turns into some kind of kumbaya love fest because humanity's choice of disobeying God has, has created havoc in this world. There is pain, there is injustice, there is evil, there is brokenness. There are hateful things that abound. But Romans 5.8 tells us that God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. While we were still sinners, his love came first. God showed mercy toward us, and Jesus said, go and do likewise. Yes, we need to confront injustice, and we need to deal with evil, and we'll be unpacking that around racism, racism over the next few weeks, but, but we've got to first start with a place of love that holds two truths. The first truth is, yes, we are all sinners. And the other truth is, we were all made in God's image. Many of you know that I'm a yoga enthusiast. Yoga for me is body prayer. It is a physical way for me to love God with my heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength. And when I'm doing yoga, I am praying and talking to God. And if you've ever attended a yoga class, often when the class ends, the teacher will end by saying, Namaste. Now, I'm not one to just repeat things because everybody else is saying it. So I did my own research to see what does namaste mean. And what I learned both surprised and touched me. Namaste is a Hindi word from Eastern culture, and, and what it really is is a greeting of respect. You can say it at the beginning or the end. It's like hello or goodbye. It's a three-syllable word that literally means, I bow to you. But the connotation I learned in that bowing is that I recognize the divine in you. I recognize the holy in you. Some have simplified it by saying, I see the holy light in you. And I thought, wow, from a Christian perspective, that's, that's actually biblical. That is the image of God that every person has imprinted on their soul. 
from a Christian perspective, it is honoring and recognizing that every human is in the image of God. Upon further research, I discovered that in Eastern culture, the meaning is even broader than that. In its fullest context, namaste means I greet the divine in you while also recognizing the flaws and incompleteness that is still in process. And I thought again, wow, from a Christian perspective, that's biblical too. We are all sinners. Some are found and we're connected to God. Others God is still searching for, but we are all incomplete and still in process. I particularly love how one Christian writer put it. She said, Namaste welcomes another as the beloved of God and accepts each one's less than perfect self with compassion. Let me read it again. Namaste welcomes another as the beloved of God and, and accepts each one's less than perfect self with compassion. I love that. It's, it's a beautiful image to hold. We have that we are in God's image. We have that we are still in process. And, and some of us, we, we know that we're still in process. And people we greet are still in process. But we can love them. I see that as a vision statement almost. It's what the Good Samaritan demonstrated. It's love and compassion while we're still sinners that God demonstrated through his son, Jesus Christ. And it's what Jesus invites us to do as neighbors when he says, go and do likewise. Please pray with me. Gracious God, this is, it's not an easy message and it's not easy to hear. But God, we are so grateful that you loved us while we were still sinners and that you love us still. And God, I ask that you would just continue to pour your love in our hearts in such a way that we begin to see our neighbors with fresh eyes. That we begin to recognize how much you love even those that we don't particularly care for. God, I ask that you teach us how to you take the love that you have given us because we can't do it on our own. We need your love, your power to help us love well. And so God, we open our hearts to you. Pour your love in us so that we may pour your love out to our neighbors and give you glory and praise. And we ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've come to the end of the service, and I'd like us to stand as we prepare for the benediction. And just... Hold in your heart whatever God is saying to you right now. And let it just resonate in your spirit. You may want to even make your own commitment to love well. This week, I encourage you to go in your day by day. Ask God to give you a vision for everyone you come in contact with to see them as he sees them and let his love guide. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, our only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Blessings this week.
I forgot to mention, I'd be happy to greet anyone. I would love to say hello. And we also have prayer available if you would like confidential prayer at one of our prayer stations. God bless you.